Good afternoon. This is the House Healthcare Committee uh, convening again on the afternoon of Wednesday, March 10th at 3.15. We are taking up this afternoon some additional testimony, not on a specific bill, but on the issue of uh, establishing a secure residential facility. Uh, and this, the House Institutions Committee is looking for a recommendation from the House Healthcare Committee on the proposal to uh, construct a 16 bed replacement facility for the current seven bed Middlesex facility. We have a number of uh, witnesses who many of whom have shared letters with us, but who would like to briefly also share some thoughts in person. And again, uh, Colleen, I'm going to look to you for some guidance. I have a list in front of me, but I know that there are several people who have submitted in writing several others because of our being on the floor who may not be available. But I'd like to turn first, I believe, I would confirm with Colleen, uh, we should first be hearing from Shay Witzberger. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Shay, uh, I apologize if I have not pronounced your name properly. I don't have, I see the name on your screen is a different you name. So great. Would, You're would you, doing awesome, Lee. Okay, well, would you welcome, I'm gonna try and turn my button. Would welcome you and if you would introduce yourself with your proper name, I'd appreciate it. I will. My name is Shay Witzberger. Um, I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. And I'm a rem uh, resident of Dummerston, Vermont. Thank you. Um, coming to you live from outside the Putney Library because that last mile internet is not great for this purpose. And for uh, the day when you're not going to be freezing outside. <laughs> it's beautiful. I'm grateful. <laughs> Wish um, we were outside. <laughs> yeah, it's chilly, but so welcome. Um, yeah. I would like to share with you a few thoughts um, from my role as co-facilitator of the Brattleboro Community Safety Review Project. I can send you all a link to the full yeah. document after this. Um, that project in Brattleboro was inspired by the uprisings around ending state racist state violence this last spring. Um, and morphed into a facilitated town committee project through the select board to listen to our community about community safety and the existing systems of community safety that exist, what their impact is, what their accessibility is, focusing on partly policing, but also as we took a broader lens about what's causing safety, danger, and harm in our community, the mental health system came into some pretty clear focus. So a couple of reflections about that I would love to share with you all as I've been following this Middlesex replacement process. Um, we listened to over 250 individual community members and over workers from over 25 organizations in our project. And um, overwhelmingly, generally, but also particularly from people who are psychiatrically labeled, psychiatrically disabled, neurodivergent, or self-identify as mad. Um, folks named that one of the biggest threats to their safety in our community was locked wards and the treatment that people received behind them, um, behind those doors. Uh, one person uh, who shared with us said, our experiences happen behind closed doors, so, and we're not even allowed to have our cell phones to record them. So some of this awareness that's coming about state violence elsewhere is not available to us inside of psych institutions because we can't even record what's happening to us. Um, many people said that the current system of mental health care is punitive, that the, um, you know, in, enacting mental health warrants and the presence of locked wards function as functionally incriminate mentally ill people. Um, and many, many people very concerningly named that existing facilities in our area are causing so much harm that multiple different people use the word torture to describe what's happening in these spaces. Um, and another really strong theme that came through was that there is very little accountability for that harm that's happening. Um, there's li little accountability from DMH or the institutions themselves uh, for any harm that's happening. Um, some of those harms uh, have already, as I understand, been taken off of the table of the Middlesex facility. Many people experience um, restraints and seclusion and forced drugging to be very violent, taking away their bodily autonomy, which is 
the definition of trauma for many people. Um, but also the presence of a locked word where your bodily autonomy is limited and you do not have control over what happens to you is really traumatizing for a lot of folks. Um, a challenge that many people named is that they don't feel like they can access any systemic mental health care if the threat of forced hospitalization is on the table. They can't call a line. They can't go to their local designated agency. They can't access any healthcare safely if the threat of forced hospitalization is present. And what these folks name to us as, I'm not a psych survivor. I'm, I, I feel like my role in this project was as a translator between what people shared in focused listening sessions and our local governance. And what folks shared was that continued investment by the state into only the most carceral, punitive, locked aspects of the mental health care system feels like an injustice. Mm -hmm. And that there's very little resourcing happening monetarily of some alternatives that people named would be really supportive to our community safety. Namely, some kind of peer support on uh, that you can call either through 911 or as an alternative, a mobile crisis kind of response that's not police or crisis who will potentially take away somebody's rights. Um, a crisis space that's not the emergency room, a 24 seven drop-in space that's friendlier to people in crisis than the emergency room where people also named experiencing a lot of harm. And regarding beds, uh, we know that there is the perception that there's a shortage of beds. Um, and I think that it's arguable about whether or not an expansion of locked beds is what we need. Um, the retreat's gonna be expanding a whole new unit of I think 12 beds. That plan came after or was not in, in um, alignment with this plan for the Middlesex replacement facility. Um, and most people said that they don't wanna go into a locked facility anyway. If they need support, they need support from a home-like respite or trainings for the community and how we can support each other so that that's not people's only option. Many people who get stuck in the emergency room and cause this clog in the system of care don't want a locked ward to be the only thing that's waiting for them on the other side of that long, terrible stay. And so we, we really heard from people that this problem of the flow of the system into and out of the ER is a concern, but that more locked beds are not the solution that any psych survivors, psychiatrically labeled or disabled people, self-identified mad people shared with us um, at all. And these concerns were echoed by many people who work inside the system. This is the last thing I wanna say, that many people use the opportunity of our listening project as an opportunity to whistle blow about how concerned they are about patient treatment and existing programs and how much internal struggle workers are having enacting the practices at DMH controlled facilities. People named a, a severe lack even as providers in accountability um, the, to the harms that people are really in the traumas that people are incurring in our current system of treatment. So as I've been following this process, I've noticed that all, in addition to all the things that I just have been holding in, in the listening part of this project, project that we're doing down in my community in the Brattleboro area, also DMH has been fairly dishonest and disingenuous about some of these um, potential harms and concerns throughout the meetings that I've been listening to, which makes me feel like um, I, I really validate the concerns I heard from psychi psychiatrized people that there's very little accountability regarding harm. Um, in their virtual walkthrough, they, they omitted to walk folks through the seclusion and restraint spaces, even though that's why most people were there in the chat trying to discern about those practices. Um, there's been a lot of condescension and, uh, and avoidance of, of um, the ability for people to bring real concerns about treatment that they've experienced in these systems. Um, and people in my community have named that they desperately want money to go to alternatives, not to locked carceral spaces that create a system of punishment for people who are in distress, frankly, but rather to totally voluntary supports that people can access without fear of being criminalized. This is especially true for people who are criminalized otherwise. Queer and trans folks and people of color particularly named an inaccessibility of the system of mental health care because of their fear of essentially criminalization, whether that's police showing up to mental health welfare checks or being locked in a facility, however beautiful the views.
locks are locks, <laughs> right? Um, and so I've heard that there's some movement toward what I would call decarcerating the facility that's being built, but it is essentially still a large lock facility that's gonna take $11.5 million away from what I see as the alternatives that my community is begging the state for. So I would implore you to read the review. It's available at brattleboro.org, but I will also send a link to you all. Particular, it's very long. I don't expect that you have time to read it all, but this, the area about listening to people about the mental health system particularly, there are some deeply concerning quotes collected there um, from community about what's been occurring in the mental health system, uh, torturous treatment. And, and I'd, I'd, I can't understand how to give somebody $11.5 million who can't even account for the, the, the projects they already have under their radar. They're already causing immense harm. Um, so I, I, I would ask that you think very critically about whether or not we need to fund the most carceral, locked, prison-like aspects of our mental health system or the most voluntary accessible aspects of our mental health system in 2021 when we're considering these issues on a, uh, the, the issues about punishment and carceral treatment in, in a much more critical way. I think there are many resources available to those of us who are interested in learning about the potential harms of those systems. And you all hold a lot of power. So I really wanted to channel that information from my community directly to you so that you can uh, take that, you know, read, read that section of the report yourself and, and think about it for yourself. But from where I sit, it's a, an absolutely, uh, the opposite of what psychiatrist people in my neck of the woods are asking for. Those folks are asking for voluntary supports that are less locks and cages and restraints and seclusions and forced drugging. Those things are traumatizing. That's all I have to share. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. I'm so grateful that you all are considering this. I really am so, so grateful that you're thinking about this critically. Uh, it's, it's, it's imperative that we do so. Thank you. Thank you. And we understand you have a time, time commitment. Yeah, unfortunately. To, that's fine. Thank you. For, some, thank yeah. you for hanging in there with us this afternoon as we had to. I understand our... the schedule very, very much. I understand the facilitator's dilemma. So <laughs> carry on. Okay. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to turn to Colleen to help guide me. Uh, I see that we have... Um, Next, we'll be hearing from Calvin Moen. Great, thank, thank you. I really appreciate your help in navigating here this afternoon. So Calvin, uh, if you would join us, I see you were on the... Oh, there you are, there, there you are. <laughs> so welcome uh, to the House Healthcare Committee and... Uh, Again, thank you for your patience in being heard. But I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Uh, I understand you may have sent something to us already. Uh, some of us have not had a chance to read through everything, but uh, we also wanted to extend additional invitations to be heard briefly, so. Yeah, and I, d I really appreciate that. Thank you. I did send a letter, um, but you know there are some things that I think I can elaborate on, and there are some things that have changed um, since I wrote it. Yes. Um, so yeah, my name's Calvin Moen. Um, my pronouns are he, him. Um, and I live in Brattleboro. I have been in the area for nine years, um, during which I've been doing support and advocacy um, with people, um, individuals on the individual level, people who are impacted by um, the mental health system. Also some advocacy on organizational and state levels. Um, I myself am a psychiatric survivor and here and there mental health service user. Um, and so that's what really informs my advocacy and the peer support that I do. Um, I am also an educator. A lot of my work right now is in intentional peer support. Um, I've also uh, done training and workshops on just a whole range of things um, related to psychiatric liberation, um, the movement history, um, harm reduction as it is applied to psychiatric drugs, alternatives to police responses, um, and have done quite a bit of community building both in and around Brattleboro um, and in Greenfield, Mass, which is where I actually am currently um, because I have a hearing voices support group to do in 
about half an hour. Um, so that's some context for me from for for where I'm coming from. Um, and I've also, you know, been somewhat involved in these legislative processes before, given some testimony, written letters, um, and I. Before I really talk specifically about this proposal, I guess I just um, I wanted to address what is and has been difficult about this process um, for me, because that's what I know, but also I think for a lot of people in my community. Um, and, and I mean specifically the process around planning and making decisions about replacing the middle sex facility and also just in general, um, DMH and the way that they have really shut out uh, the voices of the people who experience the impacts of their decisions of that system. Um, so during this whole course of planning for the middle sex replacement, um, the adult state standing committee has been trying to give input. And um, from what I know, I'm not a member, but these are my colleagues. And you know, they're saying that um, the input they've been asked for has been superficial. Their objections have not been recorded, have not been listened to. And so, you know, we find ourselves at this moment here, um, kind of locked in this struggle um, when I don't think it needed to be this way. I think that we could have had a much more participatory process. Um, and the, the process that Shay was just talking about, uh, the community safety review in Brattleboro, has really stood out to me as a model for what's possible, how we could be um, getting input from people who are you know, the most impacted because this is, this is a process that's just really not accessible overall. Um, I, you know, I come here at, at a certain cost to, to myself emotionally and energetically. Um, I am appreciating being here, I'm very grateful. And I'm just saying that as someone who um, is psychiatrically labeled that um, showing, showing emotion in the wrong way, in the wrong place um, can, can just be really dangerous. Um, that for us, you know, that is how people end up locked up. That's how people end up um, in restraint and seclusion and forcibly medicated and court ordered. Um, so as, as hard as it is for me to kind of show up and do this, there are, there are many who are at greater risk and are more vulnerable. Um, and so their voices are not heard. They're not, you know, they're not at the table. And so I think we need, I need, we need a change to how this happens. We need a change to this process of how these decisions get made. Um, because it's, yeah, it's just really draining. Um, I've been a part of advocacy for years now where we've been asking for the kinds of alternatives that Shay mentioned just now. And instead what we get is just this expansion of the current harmful system, just more, more of the same. And to me, that is what this middle sex proposal, this replacement um, really is. And even without um, the seclusion, the restraint, the forced drugging, um, it is still not, a therapeutic space. It is still not a, a residence. It's not a home, um, and it's not community-based. Um, so if I'm locked inside, that's that's not home. That's confinement. That's institutionalization. Um, it's not healing, um, and it's not community. It's a centralized facility. We're talking about quite a large facility. Um, that's that's just really not not home-like in, in any of the descriptions of it that I've heard. Um, and yeah, and by expansion, you know, I am talking about more than doubling the current capacity. And I've heard that there's arguments for that based on some numbers that um, may not be up to date and also just represents a continuation of a movement in a direction that is just ignoring our requests, our repeated requests for um, more options, for different options. 
Um, and I think too that COVID has kind of shown us that um, these congregate settings of this size uh, are, are just not safe. I don't think we're out of the woods. I, you know, I, why does it make sense to plan for us to never have another pandemic again? Uh, people are safest in their homes for that reason and for so many other reasons, uh, including throughout this pandemic, there's been even less accountability, um, right? Advocates have not been able to go into locked units um, to witness what's happening, to provide, you know, advocacy and support to those who are inside. You know, Shay spoke to that. Um, and yeah, she also spoke to what we have been asking for instead. Um, and as part of a movement that um, has been going since at least the 70s, none of this is new. None of these requests and what we've been asking for um, are new, right? Peer respite, supportive drop-in space, you know, completely voluntary support, um, material supports, okay? So if we're talking about spending all this money on something we're calling a residence that is at best a hospital and maybe kind of a jail, um, what about actual housing? We are in an enormous housing crisis in Vermont and have been and, um, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> to think about putting all these resources somewhere else um, that, that people are identifying as actually being harmful. Um, it's, it's a betrayal of, of Vermonters, of those who are in the care of DMH. And, you know, the, the mental health system will say, well, you know, these are folks who need X, Y, and Z, right? They need to be um, in a locked facility. They need this level of support. And uh, I, a little noisy behind me here. We're in the community center. I, um, I challenge that, you know, because, uh, I, I know folks who have been in and out of these systems, right? I uh, have a friend right now who has been through residential, has been through step down, you know, not because they were not, you know, they were never locked up because they were like violent towards other people or dangerous in any way. And those programs did not address any of the underlying needs that this person still exists with. Um, physical pain, isolation, uh, disability, lack of transportation. Um, and so this person is still repeatedly hospitalized um, because they still are in distress because these needs are, are still going unmet. Repeated hospital stays are not changing any of that. They're not, um, they're not breaking this cycle that this person is in. Um, and, and when I'm talking about my friend, I really could be talking about, you know, a composite of half a dozen people I know would fit the same example. But, um, you know, this is a friend who would prefer to go spend time at Alyssum, uh, which is the peer respite in Vermont, two, two beds for the whole state. Um, it's often not available. There's, I think the waiting list is usually about a month. Um, and so, yeah, is going through these repeated hospitalizations that are traumatizing, that are expensive, um, and meanwhile is seen as failing, right? Failing to recover um, because what's being tried over and over again isn't working. And I think it's time that we try something else. Um, this proposal is meant to address this problem of flow through the system and capacity of, you know, the inpatient units and the, the ERs. Um, there are other ways to address that, uh, that are not expanding the existing system that is not addressing the harm, but is actually causing the harm um, because it, it replicates itself, it, you know, analogous to like the prison system, which locks people up uh, thereby kind of breaking up families, breaking up communities, um, breaking up those, those natural supports that people have, which leads to just further incarceration. We're looking at a really similar 
kind of structure. Um, we need alternatives to the emergency room, which would then relieve the pressure on those long emergency room stays. We keep hearing about there's this emergency room problem, people are staying there too long. Why are we not talking about the problem of nobody wants to go there? It is a terrible, terrible place to be. If you're in any kind of extreme or altered state, if you're having some kind of crisis, they can't do anything for us there, but put us in a room and tell us to wait a few days. Um, yeah, why is that not what we're talking about as the ER problem? So I'm suggesting, and many, many of us have suggested, if there are more alternatives, more options, that is in fact what's going to relieve that pressure and that capacity problem on the current system. And is going to start to stem the harm and the trauma that we are repeatedly experiencing by going through the system again and again. I think that's all that I had. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, and uh, I appreciate, I appreciate uh, you being willing to share your perspectives and your voice with us. Um, and in the interest, because we do have three more people who have asked to be heard, uh, I'm going to stop there for now and not open it up to further questions, uh, but to thank you and. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity and I'm glad you're doing this. I'm glad you're hearing from folks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care, Calvin. I'm, again, I'm going to look to Colleen to help guide me. Next, we'll be hearing from Emily uh, Megas Russell, resident of Brattleboro. Great. Thank you, Colleen, for your help. Uh, so, Emily Megas Russell, uh, welcome. I see you on the screen now. Yes. Hi, folks. Can you hear me okay? I believe we can. Great. Thank you so much for hearing from, um, from us and from me. And um, let's see, I'm just setting my screen up here. Yeah, so um, I am Emily Megas Russell. I am a uh, resident of Brattleboro. I'm also a licensed uh, social worker, clinical social worker. Um, I have been licensed for over 10 years and I've worked in a variety of different clinical and administrative capacities across the field of mental health. I've been in Vermont for about 10 years. So I've been doing that in Vermont for that period of time. Um, for seven years, I worked at Healthcare and Rehabilitation Services of Southeastern Vermont, uh, HCRS, which is one of the largest agencies designated by the state to provide mental health and addiction services to Vermonters. Um, I held a few different roles in my time with HCRS, um, but for this, uh, the sake of this testimony, uh, most notably, I was the program director at Meadowview Recovery Residence in Brattleboro, Vermont, which is a unlocked intensive residential program for adults with significant mental health needs that were stepping down from inpatient hospitalization. Uh, I then served as the director of residential services at HCRS. And for several years, I oversaw the agency's five residential facilities. These are residential facilities are on the same spectrum as um, the Middlesex facility that we're discussing. So I'm quite intimately aware of what's going on inside of these facilities and how they're managed administratively and clinically. Um, and it's really that lens that I wanna speak uh, to this project from. I worked with the Middlesex facility. I've worked very closely with DMH as well um, because all of these programs are overseen by DMH. Um, I was in constant dialogue in those roles with the department around um, around bed capacity and level of care coordination. Uh, and then I ended my time at HCRS as the quality assurance manager overseeing clinical quality of care, which also bled into some of the content here uh, in regards to um, residential care. But as the director of residential services at HCRS, I had the privilege of working with individuals who were experiencing mental health crises and extreme states in these residential environments that were unlocked and hands off. So quite notably significantly different than what's being proposed in the middle sex facility, which is a locked unit that allows restraint seclusion. And um, I know there's maybe a change in what is being proposed with involuntary medication. Um, and, and with seclusion and restraint, just to just because okay. that, that's only been announced yesterday, but that's something okay, great. Important, important to be clear. Thanks. So, 
Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and I, as I just said, I also work closely with the DMH and coordinating level of care needs. You know, these programs are far from perfect. They're absolutely um, you know, subject to some of the very same challenges that Cal Calvin, for example, just spoke to in terms of congregate environments and really needing, we really need to support people in getting housed and in staying housed. Um, all people, regardless of what the physical health abilities or disabilities are, or mental health needs are, we really need to be focused on supporting people in accessing housing and remaining housed. So these residential programs, you know, I certainly don't want to pitch them as perfect on any level, the, the unlocked intensive residentials. However, in these programs, the fact that residents were able to live in a home-like setting that was not locked, in which they were not effectively imprisoned, and that were hands-off, meaning no restraint seclusion, staff were not trained in physical de-escalation or restraint seclusion, and no forced drugging used, um, these were critical factors in honoring the human rights of the residents. And even in these settings, we really struggled to remain person-centered and to support folks in being self-directed in their own care because these programs are really paternalistic and fear-based in the way that we relate to folks living with extreme states and mental health needs. Um, and, and you know they can really serve to uphold violent stigmas against people who experience extreme states. Very, you know, very small percentage of people experience violence, um, or I should say a very small percentage of people are violent, uh, people with mental health um, needs and, and who are psychiatrically labeled. And we know from the research that folks who, um, who are psychiatrically labeled are much more likely to be victims of violence than they are perpetrators of violence. And frankly, what we're talking about here when we're talking about restraint, seclusion, and forced drugging is we're talking about state-sponsored violence. Um, so although I no longer work in community mental health or residential services, I currently have a private practice uh, where I do work with folks who um, also experience uh, psychiatric hospitalization and imprisonment. Um, I remain in passionate opposition to this facility, to the proposed middle sex replacement facility. Um, and I oppose the building of the first one, frankly. Uh, my opposition is based in my experience as a clinician working with people experiencing extreme states and who are psychiatrically labeled. Also, it's rooted in my experience as an administrator of residential programs with a working understanding of the great expense that this project would incur to the detriment of those it proposes to serve and to taxpayers. And as an activist for human rights with an intimate knowledge of the grave risk to vulnerable Vermonters that this facility poses. In the unlocked hands-off residential programs, we admitted folks directly from locked inpatient facilities. So this means that many folks who step down to the residential programs, the, I'm talking about the intensive residentials that are unlocked and do not use restraint seclusion or forced drugging, many of these folks days, weeks before had experienced restraint, seclusion, and voluntary medication in the hospital, right? Not much had changed about them. What was different was the environment that they were in. And many of these folks were very able to be successful in an unlocked environment where restraint and seclusion were not used. And at the time, this was well before Middlesex uh, existed, at the time, Meadowview Recovery Residence was considered, along with Second Spring, were considered the most intensive, the most restrictive, the most safe or secure environments that we had residentially. Um, meaning that folks who were presenting with some of the more extreme states um, that had been hospitalized for years, one client over a decade, right? And this is when the state hospital was still around and we were still doing that in the state. We are still doing that, but um, that was much more common practice before Hurricane Irene took the state hospital. So what I'm saying is that we had folks who had been hospitalized for decades over a decade, one person I'm re recalling, um, and some for many years who had experienced restri uh, restraint, seclusion, and forced drugging pretty chronically, in fact, as part of the hospitalization, were able to step into a unlocked, hands-off environment, right? And I think that's something that we have to really ask ourselves when we are challenged with this sort of argument that we need these facilities that are able to take people's human rights, violate pe people's human rights, right? That we have many, many examples. And I'm telling you at this time, I was the director of this program. So I was very much in touch with what was happening in regards to 
individuals who are coming to us after many years in these hospitals, having experienced um, a lot of violence, who were able to live successfully in an environment where staff were not trained or allowed to use um, hands-on techniques. Um, so, you know, a lot of people argue that there are just some people who can't stay safe or we just need these kinds of facilities. And I really, I will say in my years in these programs and working in mental health, there of course are moments of escalation and there are some moments of violence, but my opposition to this project is not rooted in a naive belief that violence is or will not exist. My opposition is rooted in a nuanced and complex understanding of the root causes of violence. A clear vision for resources, supports, and projects that address those root causes and actually reduce violence, right? And I'm, I'm happy to talk with folks, you know, about how do we as a culture address violence and cultivate safety. This is a huge focus of my clinical and activism work. But one thing is clear, further legalization, expansion, and capitalization of state-sanctioned violence in the form of carceral approaches to mental health and safety will not lead to an overall reduction in violence. And, and you know, I, as I think about this project and the proposal, I think about the sort of, if you build it, they will come. Like, if we allow this facility to be built, the Department of Mental Health will fill it with human bodies. Absolutely 100%. And those human bodies will be forced to comply and obey. And the mechanisms of force that will be used have been called torture by the United Nations Commission on Human Rights and the very people that this project purports to serve. As Calvin and Shea both shared, this project is not bold, it is not brave, it is not visionary. It does not matter how comfortable the furniture is or how brightly painted the walls are. If people are trained and expected to violate the human rights of its residents as part of the course of treatment, we're building a prison, a place that sanctions violence and torture and we must stop saying otherwise. Even worse, the Department of Mental Health in the state will profit from it. Actually not worse, <laughs> but in addition, um, there will be profiting from it. The beds will be filled and I don't believe that Vermonters mental health will be any better off for it. Um, alternatives abound. And as Calvin expressed, have abounded since the 70s and, and actually since I believe the beginning of time. In other words, alternative ways for communities to support and actually show genuine care and consideration for the mental health of its community members exist at all levels of care and all levels of entry into the system. I think the what Calvin mentioned about alternatives to the ER, you know, um, emergency rooms around the state have complained for years and years and years about having to deal with people who have mental health issues. Why have we not created an alternative? If, if we don't believe that the hospital is the right place for people having a mental health crisis, why haven't we created a viable alternative, right? Um, it doesn't make sense to me that a community, you know, we couldn't, a community could not have an ER, right? It could not have a place for people with physical health emergencies to go and get care. Why are we okay with us not having uh, mental health alternatives, if in fact the ER is going to, you know, convince us that they're not the appropriate place. Um, and, I, and I don't believe they are the appropriate place. I would agree with that. So I'll just end by saying, you know, I urge y'all to do the brave, bold, and courageous thing and to stop this train in motion. There are dozens of other visionary, humane, safe, and life-affirming projects that could be funded with this large amount of money. I urge you to use your power in protection of human rights and to demand that Department of Mental Health revision itself in alignment with the actual and expressed needs of those with lived experience of psychiatric labeling, involuntary hospitalization, and torturous forms of coercion and violence. This facility is on the wrong side of history. Thank you. Uh, Thank we're you. gonna take a couple of brief questions, but I am going to insist that we hear from our both our witnesses who have been waiting. And so I'm gonna ask Representative Burroughs and Representative Golden and the responses to be relatively brief because otherwise we're, I feel like we will be disrespectful to others who have waited all afternoon. Mm -hmm. Representative Burroughs and Representative Goldman. Thank you, um, and thank you for your testimony. Um, my question is, do you, know, uh, uh, do you know off the top of the head of your head what your success rate was and what it was based on? It's a great question. I don't, you're talking about the residential facilities, right? Yeah, yeah it's been some time and that I've been in that role and um, 
as I said, I oversaw five programs. There's just so many numbers that I couldn't accurately represent, you know, and, and I, I don't, I also, as I said briefly, I don't want to misrepresent either and say that, you know, rainbows, butterflies, kumbaya, right? Like, the, you know, the, the unlocked intensive residential facilities, not only they have their own struggles, but they also, there are folks who left those facilities and had to go back to the hospital, for example, for a number of reasons, right? And so those are definitely, um, there are situations of that. What I will say is that the success of these programs, this is qualitative, not quantitative, of course, uh, the success of these programs really had to do with our ability to engage the individuals living in them, right? And um, that's a very dynamic conversation in terms of what that looks like. But I will say that even as an unlocked facility, and even without any trained or sanctioned use of restraint or seclusion, staff never put their hands on a client, a resident in those facilities, clients consistently told us it felt like they were in a prison, right? And we consistently had to, you know, because although it's a voluntary program, very few people that are put, that are like, have this as the, the option on their table, have another viable option, right? Like, it's middle sex facility or bust for many people, right? Or it's Meadowview recovery residence or bust for many people for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of them economic in addition to you know, other reasons. And so the point that I'm trying to make here is that um, some of the factors when we were able to be successful, which really looked like folks stepping out of the residential facilities into communities had everything to do with how much in those residential facilities we're able to engage people, center their rights and their needs and help them access a community, right? The, it's, you know, part of our treatment plan for access and community would be things like go to the co-op every day and buy a carrot so that you see the same person every day so that you feel connected and part of a community because these programs are, are, are institutions, right? and they um, institutionalize people. And so it makes it even harder for folks to access their own communities or feel part of a community. Um, Representative Goldman. My question is really brief. I was looking for your testimony. I found it very compelling. And on our website, it looks like, did you do a written submission on February 9th? Yeah. We click on that, it goes to the committee website. So I'm not sure we have access to that. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping that maybe you could resubmit or we could have it posted just so I would be able to review it. So I'm not sure where that stands, but that would be helpful to me. Sure, I it would. I have Colleen's email because she reached out to out me. started out with Colleen, I'd appreciate I can just send that to Colleen. Sure, thank you thank all you. so much. Thank you so much for hearing us. Thank you, thank you very much. Colleen, I believe uh, Eva Westheimer is yes. to be her next. Welcome, Eva. Welcome, Welcome to the House Health Care Committee. Yeah, thank you all so much for, for hearing me this afternoon and for hearing um, all of the voices that just came before me this afternoon. Um, my name is Eva Westheimer, and I'm the Programs and Volunteer Coordinator with Out in the Open. Out in the Open is a statewide and regional nonprofit organization which works to connect rural LGBTQ folks together to build community, visibility, knowledge, and power throughout our state and region. So as a part of our organization and our community, we work towards health justice. What that means to us is we're working towards a day when all people in our community have the economic, social, and political power and resources to make decisions about their own bodies and health, regardless of their identities and experiences. And that's a big piece of how we focus our work and talk with our community members in, in the community. We know that with pressure and community organizing from the community, as we've talked about this afternoon, that the proposed uh, replacement middle fix Middlesex facility has already altered their plans, right, within the respects of these very harmful and torturous uh, treatments such as seclusion, restraint, and forced drugging. Those changes we know have happened because folks within the community, such as the folks who have you heard from today, have been reaching out tirelessly to express how these treatments are continuously harmful. We continue to oppose the new facility as, the, as our state needs to focus on these alternatives such as what we've been talking about as peer respites, community supports, and long-term housing. 
people need care, our LGBTQ community needs care, and what we need now is the funds directed in that right direction. As we wrote to you all in our letter, the ways that the psychiatric system has pathologicalized LGBTQ folks over time is well documented. We know that facilities like these and involuntary treatment impact our LGBTQ community members. Many within our community connect with us and share their experiences, share how these systems have harmed them and have created long-term trauma. We know that this facility will continue, this proposed facility will just perpetuate that harm. Our LGBTQ community members need to be prioritized with care and healing. People's mental health is not solved, that's solved by pathologicalizing and incarcerating our community members when they say that they are in distress. We need to listen to folks and, and take what they're experiencing in hand. Facilities like the proposed one don't address suicidality, poverty, trauma, or structural marginalization. Instead, it perpetuates and increases all of these things whether it looks like psychiatric incarceration or through criminal justice incarceration. We also know several things, right? We know that the current Middlesex facility must close. We know that that's why we're here, you know, and we also know that the state has an opportunity to create alternatives. We have $11.5 million at hand that can be used to create those alternatives. So we're, we're asking for alternatives. And in fact, the state has those, the resources to put towards those alternatives. The mental health supports and healing that people need, including our LGBTQ community members, are not going to happen in a facility whose original intent was to have solitary confinement, was to have restraint, and was to have forced drugging. And we know that although that, that announcement was made just yesterday to take those pieces out, those updates haven't been updated um, in any facility walkthrough. And even when, the when those things were included in the facility, they weren't included in the walkthrough itself. We attended the meeting of the DMH. And when we walked through, those, those pieces were intentionally omitted to the public and to the community. So as a state, again, I'm at sharing and knowing that you all have an opportunity to create new solutions. And these solutions must be led by folks with lived experiences, people who are neurodivergent, people who are psychiatrically labeled, psychiatrically disabled, and self-identified mad folks. The state has the opportunity to move the resources to community care solutions and not continue trauma. So we had out in the open called the House Health Care Committee and Vermont legislators not to fund this expensive, ineffective, trauma-producing, incarcerated incarceration facility like the middle sex replacement and instead direct funding towards peer respites community supports and long-term housing thank you all so much thank you very much for bringing your voice to the table today yes thank you i think we have one more witness who we asked to have moved to today, and I believe is still available, and that's Devin Green from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Healthcare Systems. And Devin, you have the floor. Great, thank you. Devin Green, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Care Systems, and Health Systems, <laughs> rather. Um, I agree 100% that more resources need to go throughout the care continuum. I would say the way that this has been presented is as a zero sum game. And I understand why it's being presented that way because usually that is the case in a budget year. You have a, a small pot of money that can only go so far, but I think we're in a really unique place at this moment in time to rethink our mental health system because we have a lot of federal funding coming our way. So in the latest COVID-19 relief package, um, and these are national numbers, not Vermont numbers, but there is 1.5 billion towards community mental health services block grant. There's 50 million for funding community-based behavioral health needs that are worsened by COVID-19. 
and there's 420 million for certified community behavioral health clinics. And I use behavioral health clinics in quotes because that is what is in the federal legislation. Um, so I do want to stress that right now the entire continuum needs resources, but that we should not peg one project against another in this case, um, that we have funding from the federal government coming specifically for um, community health. And I would also say that um, one project in particular that we support is an alternative to emergency departments. In previous years, advocates have not supported um, that project necessarily, I would say our ED directors would love to re-engage in that conversation and talk more about um, what we could do there because I think um, I think if there's one thing we can all agree on, it's that emergency departments are um, not a great place for individuals to be when they're in a mental health crisis. And I will say that, um, well, what I'll say next is just that um, I, my understanding is that this secure residential facility is for individuals who have not been accepted by community services. So when all other community services have said no, that is when these individuals go to the residential facility. <laughs> Um, it's a small group of individuals. It is people who are no longer appropriate for being in a hospital, which is a restrictive setting. And so this is placement to transition them out of the hospital and back into the community. Um, I, because this is a setting for folks who um, are not accepted by community, other community services, I would ask that there be some kind of guarantee in place that folks who are ready to be discharged must be accepted by the community if this residential facility is not gonna happen. Um, because we have seen in the past that this small number of people can be in the hospital for a very long time when there's no sort of step down option for them to go to. Um, a couple of years ago, there was an inpatient psychiatric barrier days analysis, which found that over two and a half years, 45 patients stayed 981 days longer in the hospital than was necessary due to delays for placement in a supervised living facility. So, we need to make sure that there is a step down option. And I've heard the answer from other folks testifying that it should be in the community. And I agree that we should have more step down options in the community for folks who um, are less serious and not at the level where the community resources are not accepting them. But we also need an option for um, when community resources are not accepting these small group of patients. Um, and we are continuing to see delays in the emergency department. It's still a problem. Uh, you know, it was really interesting during COVID when folks were told that they should not go to uh, hospitals to preserve resources and also people didn't want to get COVID. There was a real drop um, in the amount of visits to the emergency department. We had almost 1,500 fewer visits in the emergency department this year, but the wait was uh, the same. The amount of wait time, which again, we can measure in days. It's an average of a day or two, which is not right. <laughs> um, it's supposed to be about four hours. Um, that, that wait is still the same. And that weight is really dangerous to those patients. Um, at this point, a lot of our EDs are realizing that it is not the condition necessarily that results in violence, but the, the long wait. That anyone who waits in an emergency department for days at a time will likely, um, you know, uh, their condition will deteriorate. So, 
we, um, again, we agree 100% that there needs to be more resources going into the communities. We think that that is going to uh, be a possibility with the latest infusion of federal funding. And we'd love to be in on that process to improve um, the resources for community services. Um, but we don't want this to be a zero sum game. We want the whole continuum to be, um, to be funded because we see that even a small group of individuals, um, don't leave those small group of individuals out, right? Like they, um, they have a huge impact on the system. Um, they, will, they will add up to those 983 days where we could serve so many more people uh, in the hospital during that time. So I would just say, you know, I think healthcare is going in this direction in general where we want to do more um, community. You know, we want to emphasize exercise, diet, that sort of thing. We want to prevent the heart attack. We want to prevent someone from breaking their hip. Just one moment, honey. I need some water. Okay, just one minute. Thank you, honey. Um, uh, we want to prevent um, injury from happening, and that includes psychological injury as well. But when it does happen, we need the resources to be there. So we need the uh, we need the cath lab for the heart attack patient. We need um, a, a rehab facility for someone who's broken their hip, and we need the secure residential facility for the small group of people who need the intensive treatment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there? Yes. Give, My hand won't go up. <laughs> well, I see it now. Uh, Representative Donahue. Um, yeah, a couple of different pieces. Um, I, I've read the barrier day analysis a number of times very closely. And I, I just think you might want to clarify it didn't say secure residential. It was a wide range, everything from, um, for instance, supported residential in the community, like the Pathways Program, uh, nursing home placements, which continue to be a huge struggle. Um, and in fact, it, it, uh, it didn't, I don't believe it identified in any spot the specific secure residential program. It was all sorts of supportive residentials. But, so those 900 days is, I think, a bit Am I right in my recollection of the report? Correct. It's supervised living facility. Um, that's right. But I will say that currently, um, the current secure residential facility is at 95 to 100% capacity. And I'll also say that um, with the uh, Middlesex secure residential facility, those folks uh, typically had a hospital stay of 300 days as compared to other level one patients who need intensive care, which is typically 100 days. So these are patients who need significant um, hospitalization and, and would need uh, a step down facility to avoid further significant hospitalization. So uh, I actually had a very specific question because of um, the commissioner's announcement yesterday about emergency and voluntary um, procedures. The position paper that I think the Hospital Association had put out earlier and the emergency directors was very specific about the need for a facility that permitted emergency and voluntary procedures because otherwise these people were gonna remain stuck in the hospital. So there's a little bit of a dichotomy now in still wanting to expand beds, but is there even a need for those beds if they cannot provide the need that the hospital association believed was in a way that was necessary to be able to have those people move out? Um, I guess I'm indirectly asking what, what is the position, has your position changed or evolved on the need for emergency and voluntary procedures for this plan to work or for these beds to be of use? I, our, our thought process with the emergency and voluntary procedure is that sometimes it unnecessarily lands people back into the hospital system. So 
There is a person who may be going along fine and have a bad day and may need a brief intervention to get back on track. Um, and they could, and if they receive that brief intervention, they would remain in the Segura residential facility instead of being rehospitalized and getting back into the system. So that was our thought process for the emergency involuntary procedure. I think the issue still remains that the actual uh, placement need continues to be there. And I don't think that uh, taking away the emergency involuntary procedures will uh, collapse the whole concept of the need for the secure residential because we still need that placement. Um, in terms of the emergency room delays, um, I think that the up-to-date DMH data continues to only have involuntary patients. And you folks have the key to the voluntary patients, but that's like a year old. If it's possible to get more up-to-date. And, and also, it, have you found a way to divide the waiting times between those people who in fact, are discharged home from the emergency department, like with any kind of thing that somebody comes to the emergency department, versus those who end up um, needing to be inpatient. In other words, who's waiting for inpatient care because there isn't an inpatient bed versus who's waiting because they're still trying to connect with the family support system and they can't leave the emergency room yet. Yeah, and I really wish we had Emma Harrigan, my colleague here, because she does the data analysis. Um, my understanding is we have not been able to uh, differentiate. We can differentiate between inpatient and outpatient, but part of the issue is that the hospitals who, you go to a hospital that doesn't have an inpatient unit, you get discharged to a different hospital with an inpatient unit, um, that is a discharge out of the hospital. Um, and I believe we have some ways to estimate that, but I would have to get back to you and um, ask Emma about that. So the data we have now, we don't, when we see that data and get those reports, we don't know what wait times reflect people who are waiting to, to go home versus waiting for a bed because there isn't a bed available. I, let me get back to you on that. Okay. Um, and the other one follow up to your federal influx of money question. Have you heard something different that, that that's available as an ongoing operating cost? Because I don't think the construction is the issue. It's, it's operating over time and you know the costs of operating this over time versus community programs. Would this, is your, is what you're hearing that some of this would be long-term operating um, cost money? What I heard about the 1.5 billion um, for community uh, mental health services was it needs to be expended by 2025, which is not long-term, but it is also not one time. Can I say that I'm? Uh, I think we're all very interested in understanding what the uh, what the parameters of the new federal money might provide as opportunities, and it's very important for us to understand what those uh, what they are. Uh, some of the figures, while they sound large, if they're for the whole country, they're not very large, uh, frankly. And uh, but on the other hand, we do know that Vermont is about to receive a disproportionately large influx of federal dollars. And I think we should work, we, we have asked and we're going to formally ask with a letter from myself and Senator Lyons, the federal group, uh, policy group to re-engage, uh, which had been engaging previously to help us make sure we understood how the federal policy changes interface with Vermont current policy and statutes. Uh, but it's imperative that we that we understand this as we make important and really pivotal decisions, uh, uh, particularly about this system of care, um, as well as uh, well as the whole healthcare system generally, where there's a lot of also changes pending. So we're we're in the midst of uh, some fast flowing streams, which we need to understand as we try to make some decisions. Um, and I will look to 
everyone uh, in the various parts of the healthcare system to help us become knowledgeable about that. And Devin, I would ask you and welcome you as well as others. Uh, we are going to engage with our federal delegation through all the different points of access that we have. But we, we all need to, uh, in a relatively uh, rapid way, have some sense of what, what possibilities may exist. And of course, our appropriations committees are going to be deeply involved in that as well. Um, thank you, Devin. And I, I want to say, again, express my appreciation for your flexibility from, yeah, was that yesterday? It, <laughs> that was yesterday. It seemed like it was days ago. But yet, from yesterday, uh, your flexibility in joining us again today. And, um, and quite honestly, uh, committee members have been asking, what are the, what's the time frame in coming to closure on this? And I'm in conversation with the chair of our institutions committee, uh, who of course are putting together the capital bill. Uh, we're in the midst of trying to make other significant decisions and we will be doing our best to try to find a way to balance uh, carefully uh, all of what we've been hearing and we've heard from others, both in terms of letters and other communications to us. This, I think, this is an important. Uh, this is an important decision point, and uh, I think we're going to need to hear from each other as a committee, as committee members, as to what we think might make best sense, how we take next steps, and how we work with both the department as well as our community partners in trying to uh, continue to make sure that Vermonters have access to the kind of assistance and care that they're looking for. Uh, I, I, I have another commitment sharply at 4.30, and so I'm going to turn to Res Representative Barrows, and I think that's what we're going to need to do at this point in terms of questions. Representative Barrows, Burrows, not Barrows, Burrows. It's part Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I would really love to uh, find out the the difference in the success rate between the, the uh, locked versus unlocked facilities. Um, do you think if I if I write to Commissioner Squirrel, she might be able to. I don't know if they'll have the information you're looking for, but that would be the appropriate place to direct your question, I think, to Commissioner Squirrel. And, and I'm happy to have you do that on behalf of our committee. OK, thank you. Great. And, and I will share if I hear back on the forensic information I've been requesting yes. multiple times. So so let, let me. Uh, so in the interest of. Uh, moving us forward on a number of issues, uh, a redraft of, so I'm changing, I'm switching gears here. So just so people are aware. Uh, a number of us have been working to hear what we heard from witnesses around H210, the health equity slash health disparities bill. Uh, we have, some of us have worked with uh, Katie McLinn who is the lead drafts person on H210. And uh, my hope is that a draft, a redraft of 210 based on a lot of what we've heard uh, will be available to send out to committee members, uh, perhaps even later this evening. Uh, can't promise that early tomorrow morning, if not. And, um, that's, that's intended to put something on the table for us to use as a point of discussion as a committee. Uh, so read it with that eye in mind, uh, read it with what you've heard in mind. And uh, as, I, as, we've, as I've done in the past, I, my practice or our, my practice has been to try to put something on the table that allows us to move forward with discussion. Uh, again, I find it profitable to do that from a document if possible. Uh, rather than having us all try to craft a new bill from start to finish. So this is, a this is a proposal based on what we've heard. I think you'll find it familiar in many regards. Take a look at it. My hope is that we may turn to that for committee discussion tomorrow afternoon after the floor. That's my hope at this point, and that we reserved a great deal of time on Friday. We, uh, we're still under expectation and pressure to bring closure. We'll see if that's possible. Uh, and I'm in communication with leadership about what those pressures are. Um, so again, uh, that's, that's my update on that you, in response to earlier questions about where we are and the pressures on that. Tomorrow morning, we are going to be hearing 
further information on another issue that was a high priority for this committee, and that was uh, possible expansion of Dr. Dinosaur. Uh, and we'll see if there's something that is possible for us to do in the term time frame we have. But we'll be hearing from the Department of Health Access, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate tomorrow morning. And then I believe we'll bring closure to H104 uh, tomorrow morning as well, where I think we've actually, uh, we haven't seen, all of us haven't seen all the language, but I think there was a pretty clear committee consensus that we were going to recraft that bill. And uh, Representative Peterson had expressed, initially expressed interest in reporting that bill. And then as we were getting into it, we all could see the expression on his face and others like, oh my. Uh, but I think once we reached closure, I think it may have become more possible to consider again. And I have approached him to see if he would, and he has agreed to uh, the possibility of uh, taking that bill to the floor on behalf of our committee. We'll see where we are tomorrow morning. And uh, Art, you're not uh, tied to something until we have a chance to walk through it. And we'll all work together, if you do that, to support you on the floor. Uh, so with that, I think I need to run. And I think that brings us to closure. Or to a